Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well today. It's a beautiful sunny day outside and we're so glad that uh, uh, you could join with us today as our Grace Baptist Church uh, Facebook Live. Uh, each one of our members, we hope that you're on this morning and uh, enjoy, been enjoying the sermons that we've been preaching. For those of you that are not part of Grace Baptist Church, uh, I pray that uh, uh, you enjoy this too and you get a blessing and God will uh, speak to you. And this morning we're going to be preaching a message that we've entitled Peace in the Midst of the Storm. And we find this uh, uh, text over in a uh, couple of places in the New Testament, but the one we're going to be looking at this morning is from Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 45 and 41. And before we get into the text and the reading of the text, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to wake up to another day of life. We know that each and every day is a gift from you. We thank you for that. We never want to take it for granted, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to, to be able to come into the homes and uh, to our congregation and to others uh, through the means of Facebook Live and to be able to, to preach a sermon, to be able to share some words of comfort and encouragement during this time that we're living in. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, intervene in a mighty way, that you're in control. Uh, I pray that you would heal uh, people that have the virus, uh, those that have symptoms, that you would uh, uh, be with the medical staff. I, I thank you for our nurses and uh, the medical staff that has been uh, handling things during this, uh, this crisis. And I pray that you would be with our government leaders, uh, our governor, and the president, and others who are making decisions and helping us, dear Lord. And we pray that we would make the best decisions uh, with all the information that we have uh, as to when we may go back to church and uh, as to when would be best for our congregations and for us and the safety of individuals and safety of uh, all that would be there and, and just to glorify your name. We want to use every means that we can. Uh, I know many people are wanting to get back together, but dear Lord, we want to be safe and we want to, uh, to make sure that you're in control. Lord, we pray that you would take this message. I pray that you would use me as a dying man to preach to dying men, uh, that you would remove me out of the way, that it would not be me that people hear or see, but it would be you, and that you would be glorified and you would be honored. We know your word does not return void, and we pray, dear Lord, that you would use this word to encourage us, uh, to strengthen us. And if someone is lost, doesn't know you, that they would see that you are peace in the midst of the storms, that you are there in our crisis, and uh, they can turn to you if they know you in a personal way. We ask these things in the most beautiful, precious, and holy name that we know, that of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you have your Bibles there, I want you to turn, and maybe you've already turned, uh, to Mark chapter 6. We're going to begin with verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side, before unto Bethesda, while he sent away the people. And when he had seen, sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them and to the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word, that we have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that's receptive to his word this morning. This morning I want to examine a text that kind of parallels uh, what we're going through in our world. We're going through some difficult days, some dark and difficult days, and, and they're filling our hearts with fear and worry and anxiety. Our text records a time when the disciples of Jesus were in a storm. Because of the storm, they were filled with fear. And this parallels our lives at many times, but especially in the day that we're living in. Though we may have never been on a ship during a storm on the Sea of Galilee, we all experience storms in our life, and we are experiencing a severe storm called coronavirus. No matter what the storm, we can count on Jesus to come to our rescue as he did for these 12 men in that boat on the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus arrived at the boat, he addressed three areas of life that were of major concern for the disciples, and they are probably a major concern to us. As he did, he was able to replace their fear with peace. Now in verse 50, 
he had some powerful words from, uh, we see the powerful words from the lips of Jesus about their fear, their faith, and their future. Now from verse 50, we learn the glorious truth that Jesus is the ultimate source of peace for the child of God. Due to this coronavirus, there are plenty of unknowns ahead, but it is good to know that the Lord Jesus already knows about them, and he has the answer. He is the solution. He is able to give us peace when we, that we need and desire during this troublesome times and the days ahead. In our text, we see Jesus saw two things. First, he saw the serious situation, but he also saw the simple solution. I want you to notice the ten simple words that Jesus uh, used to address three areas uh, that night we, as, as we see the Lord's comforting presence and the Lord's compelling power. First, their fear was addressed. Their fear was addressed. Now, prior to the storm, things were pretty peaceful. In this chapter, we see Jesus and his disciples meeting the needs of people. In verses 30 through 45, he met the needs of hungry people. In verses 45 through 52, he met the needs of helpless people. And in verses 56 through 53, he met the needs of hurting people. These disciples were in the midst of a storm, and if they were not rescued, it would lead to their death. I would say that most of everyone is afraid of storms and death. The reason is, is because of the fear of the unknown. These disciples were told and basically made to get on the boat. They, may, they never knew they would encounter a storm, but Jesus did. Now Jesus constrains and leads us into storms and situations that we may not plan for ourselves. Storms related to health and sickness. Maybe it's a financial crisis or marital or family issues or, or the death of, of a loved one, just to name a few. This coronavirus is one of those storms. We didn't plan for it, but Jesus already knew it was going to happen. But we find that Jesus has some words for the disciple storm and the one that we are going through. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. When Jesus said, be of good cheer, it was as if he is saying to every single one of us, do not fear the storms of life. We know that sometimes it is a lot easier to say than it is to do. But let me give you three good reasons why we should refuse to fear the storms that we face. First, storms are under his control. From verse 48, we see the words, and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. He cometh unto them, walking upon the sea. And verse 51 says, and he went up into the ship, and the wind ceased. In verse 45, Jesus had placed them into the ship that was going into a storm, but he said that they were going to the other side. He knew the end from the beginning. Uh, then in verse 46, we, we see he departed into a mountain to pray. Jesus often got alone to pray, and he is our great high priest. But, you know, we're experiencing a storm in our life. But Jesus, our great high priest, is in heaven at the right hand of God, praying for us at this very moment. The disciples are terrified. They are struggling. In fact, it says they're toiling and rowing. They're fighting the storm, and they are afraid they are going to die. But Jesus uses the very thing they fear, the water, as a means to come to them. He demonstrated his control over their situation by walking on the water and later by calming the storm. This shows me that we serve a mighty big God who is in complete control of this world and our storm. And we can sing, how great is our God. There are times when life may appear out of control. But let me remind you that Jesus is still in control of your life and he's on the throne today. He's still walking on the waves and he has the power to calm those waves at his will. That is why he is absolutely worthy of our trust and our praise and our faith. Jesus was on the mountain. They were on the water. Jesus is in heaven today, and we are on this earth. Distance is not a problem to God. Demons, disease, death, distance, and nor disaster is not a problem for Christ. But second, we see that not only do we see that storms are under his control, storms are part of his plan for our lives. The disciples were in that boat in the middle of the storm because they were in the will of God. They were in the storm because Jesus sent them there. Some people may claim that the child of God or Christian will never suffer or go through tough times, but that is false. The truth is, storms are to be expected, but not feared. They are sent to, to us to help us to grow more into the image of Jesus Christ. 
Job said in Job 23, verse 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Paul said in Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the call according to his purpose. God allows what he does for our good and for his glory. But thirdly, we see storms are always for a limited time. The disciples probably thought they were finished and, and life was over. It probably appeared to them that this storm wasn't going to end and they were going to perish. But when Jesus came on the scene, he was able to show them that there is always an end to the storm. Jesus knows what you and I are facing, and he knows what we are able to take and how long the storm should last. Never forget that the storm that you are in today, or the one you may face tomorrow, did not come to stay. But it came to pass. Because we see they all just come to pass. Secondly, we see that their, their faith was addressed. In verses 49 through 50, when Jesus came to his disciples walking upon the water, they thought he was a spirit and they cried out in fear. No, uh, then he spoke to them and addressed their fears and lack of faith. This caused them to believe and have faith and a greater faith that help had arrived. When Jesus got there, he identified himself to the disciples. He said, it is I. This is a statement of, of identification and it's an emphatic personal pronoun. Here's what Jesus was saying. Men, do not be afraid of what you're facing. The I am is here. Jesus was reminding those men of who he is. We are all familiar with the I am statements written in the book of John, which we know to be true. The first one is John 6.35, I am the bread of life. Second, John 8.12, I am the light of the world. Third, John 10.9, I am the door. Fourth, John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. Fifth, John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Sixth, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the seventh, John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. When Jesus identified himself as the I am, he was stating three things. First, he is all-powerful. Now, a word for this is omnipotent. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37, it says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Jesus has proven his power time and again from the beginning of time as we know it. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, his power was revealed in the creation of the world. In Genesis 6 and 7, his power was revealed as he preserved Noah and his family on the ark. Now that was a storm, wasn't it? But in the book of Exodus, we remember the miracles surrounding the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. Time and time, again, over and over, God has proven that he has the power to exceed our wildest imaginations to do what we think cannot happen. He hasn't changed. He is still God, and he is still the Almighty. If you have a mountain that needs moving, he can move it. If you have a storm that needs calming, he can calm it. The second thing we see he is all-present. He is not all, only all-powerful. He is all-present. The word all-present means omnipresent. His very name, I am, declares him to be the one who is ever-present. Being the I am, he is always God all the time. There has never been a time when he did not exist, and there will never be a time when he will not exist. God is existent at all times, past, present, and future. He is able to be present at all places as well. He has promised every child of God that he will be with them at all times, in all places, through all the difficulties of life. In fact, in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. When the Lord says that he will not forsake us, the term literally means that he won't run out on us when the chips are down or things get bad. God is not a fair-weathered friend. He is an all-weathered friend. He is a friend that loves at all times, and he is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, We can trust him because God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 145 verse 18 says, The Lord is nigh to all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. But the third thing we see about God, he is all perceiving, which means om omniscient. 
Notice he saw them toiling in the ship. By virtue of the fact that Jesus is God, he is the one who knows all things. Nothing escapes his eye. Proverbs 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and good. Hebrews 4, 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. When Job considered the knowledge of God, he said, He knoweth or seeth the way that I take. For the child of God, this means that God is worthy of our trust because he knows exactly what we are facing, second by second and minute by minute as we journey through this life. He hasn't missed a thing that has ever happened, is happening, or will happen to you and me. He knows, he understands, and he is able to help us in our time of need, just as he did these disciples. One day, a man had the thrilling experience of going on a short cruise on the aircraft carrier USS Kennedy. He saw jet fighters that were taking off and landing and demonstrating maneuvers. He was told about a practice that is followed on all U.S. aircraft carriers. Whenever the planes are landing, or whenever they are taking off, which are, are all dangerous operations on a carrier, the captain watches from the bridge. Even if the planes are flying around the clock, he stays on the bridge, watching every landing and every takeoff. This way, each time a pilot takes off in his high-speed aircraft or lands on the deck of that floating airfield, he knows that his captain is watching. That is a picture of the Lord God Almighty, his watch care over us. Wherever we are, whatever we are involved in, whatever battle we may be facing with our spiritual enemy, whatever storm we may be in, we have the confidence that the Lord of hosts is watching and is with us. When Jesus used the words, I am, he was declaring his character as seen in the names of God from the Old Testament. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord is there. Jehovah Roy, the Lord, our shepherd. Jehovah Salom, the Lord, our peace. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our help healer. Jehovah Tishimnu, the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Shema, the Lord, is there. Jehovah Nisa, the Lord, our banner. Jehovah Kaddish, the Lord, our sanctifier. Jehovah Helion, the Lord, most high. And there's other names that we know in the Old Testament, El Shaddai, Adonai, Alpha and Omega. He is what we need to be at all times. He is what he needs to be at all times for us. He is the great I am. And as the song says, the great I am still is. But thirdly, we have seen that their fear was addressed. Their faith was addressed, but their, thirdly, their future was addressed. When Jesus came to the disciples that night, they were certain that their lives were filled with doubt. Let me get this back to where it needs to be uh, here just a moment. But we find their fear was addressed. Let me see. Their fear was addressed, their faith was addressed, and thirdly, we find their future was addressed. But we find that when he came walking upon the water that night, when he came to them, they were certain that their lives were over. The ship was going down, and they were preparing to die. Yet before Jesus came, he had let them know he had plans for their future. You see, in verse 45, he had told them to get on the ship and go to the other side. He knew where they were, and he was responsible for, for, responsible for getting them to the other side. He knew these men were going to be the ones to Sunday turn the world upside down with the gospel message. They were going to get to the other side. When he said, he, be not afraid, which is in the present active imperative, it literally means stop fearing now and never fear anything else ever again. His words were words of comfort and their words of hope, speaking peace to their present and future ahead of them. From a human perspective, the future looks bleak and uncertain. And there may not seem like there's a lot of hope right now in the world, but Jesus still gives hope. Not only with the coronavirus, but in our personal lives, there are many unknowns. Will we escape disease, bad health? Will our families survive the, the pressures of, of being uh, quarantined or pressures of being together, the pressures of life? Will those we love be all right? Will we have enough resources for the future? These are questions that only God can answer. We must leave the future in his capable hands and give ourselves over into the arms of absolute faith in him. 
when I was younger, I wrote some songs, and one of them I wrote was called In His Arms, and, and it, it said, In His arms, worries fade away. In His arms, I'm not afraid. Surrounded by life, whatever comes around to us, I'm still in His arms. You know, as we face the future, remember these three truths that give us hope. First, He is ever trustworthy. Regardless of what we face in this life, we can be absolutely certain that God will always be there. He has made promises to his children. and He will fulfill every promise he has ever made. No matter what we face, remember that he has plotted our course, planned our future, and promised to get us through and get us home. But second, he is ever available. The disciples learned a valuable lesson that night on the Sea of Galilee. God will always be there. Never count God out, no matter what we're going through. You may think he isn't around, that he doesn't care, but in truth, he will never leave you. and He will always be at your side. It may seem as he's silent, but he is there. He is always available for you and me. He is always available when you call on his name. Isaiah 58 verse 9 says, Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. There may not be many things that you can truly count on in this life. But I promise you on the authority of God's word, Jesus is one you can always depend on. He is always available to his children. But thirdly, he is ever enough. I thought of that song that we sing in church many times called, You Are My All in All, which says, You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I'm dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Recently, as I began to look into God's Word during this time, preparing messages and seeking His face, He revealed to me ten ways in which Jesus is all we need. And in the future, I plan to preach a sermon series entitled, Jesus is All We Need. Jesus is all we need, first of all, for salvation. Jesus said in John 14, 6, that He is the way. And Peter said in Acts 4, 12, there is no other name by which we can be saved. But He is also all we need for society. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. He is all we need for satisfaction. Psalm 107, verse 9 says, For he satisfied the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. He is all we need for service. John 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. He is all we need for sickness. Malachi 4.2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wing. You know, the, the gospel says many times that Jesus healed them. But he's all we need for sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, the Bible says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. But he's all we need for security. In John 10, 28 and 29, it says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He's also all we need for shame. Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery in John 8, 11, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. <coughs> Excuse me. He's all we need for storms. In Mark chapter 4, verse 39 and 41, it says, And he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and they were, there was a great calm, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? But he's also all we need for suffering. Paul had suffered with a thorn in the flesh, and in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, God said this, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Jesus is enough. Even though there may be situations that arise that we have no control over, he is enough. There may be rough days ahead for the church and for God's people, but he is enough. 
There may be economic crisis and there may be political upheaval, but through it all, know that He is enough. He is all we will ever need to meet the needs of life that may arise. God and God alone is our only hope and our only help as we journey through this life. He is all powerful, all present, and all perceiving. If He isn't enough, then we have no hope at all. He is enough spiritually. He is enough financially. He is enough physically. He is enough emotionally. And He is enough eternally. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 that his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. When the storms of life are raging, always remember that Jesus is there for you. He longs to comfort your heart and replace your fears and your worries with his perfect peace. He will do that if you will call upon him, if you're willing to cast all your cares on him. As I was preparing this message, a song came to mind that I think is fitting to use to conclude this message. And if you'll allow me to this morning, I want to use my guitar and, and sing this song. And it's an older song, but uh, I think it just is so fitting for this. And I pray that it will be a blessing to you as we use it to conclude this message. It's entitled, The Master of the Sea. One night upon the sea, the ship was tossing to and fro. Breakers dashed on every hand, angry winds around it blow. All on board were filled with pride, as the mighty billows rolled. Then he called upon the one, who the winds and waves controlled. When he reaches out his hand, fill a cease at his command. Winds and waves obey his will, when he says to them, be still. What man is this, they all to say, that the winds and waves obey. He's the one who sails with me, he's the master of the sea. Though the storms of life may rage, mighty billows round you roll. He can calm life's troubled sea, as he did in days of old. As a all I see you sail, trust in him who never fails. I'm so glad he sails with me, he's the master of the sea. When he reaches out his hand, there'll cease at his command. Winds and waves obey his will, when he says to them, be still. What man is this, they all did say, that the wind and sea obey. He's the one who sails with me, he's the master of the sea. Who sails with me? He's a master of the sea. I pray that song is a blessing to you. I pray this message has been an encouragement to you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, then contact us in some way. Uh, we have our name and our phone number there, and the way you can contact us uh, there at the bottom of the uh, post. And we pray, dear Lord, if you if you have another prayer request, just let us know, and, and we'll pray with you. We'll comfort you during this time, and, and just uh, pray pray with you, and, and bring you words of comfort that we can find from God's Word. I pray that as we close this morning with a word of prayer, that you, you've been blessed to be a part of this message today. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, we thank you for this message. We thank you, dear Lord, that you are in control. We thank you that there is peace in the midst of our storms. 
We pray, dear Lord, that you would be with each one of us as we have heard this message, as we have heard your word, that we will know deep within our heart you're our only help, you're our only hope. You are all that we need. And I pray that in the future, if God allows, that we can preach this sermon series that Jesus is all we need. And, and dear Lord, we pray that it would be an encouragement because we know you are all that we need. I pray that you would be with each one of our members, those that are sick and shut in. Some that are in the hospital. Some are facing surgery, dear Lord, and others are recuperating. We just pray that you would be with them. And we pray that you would be with all of our leadership and all of our members, dear Lord, during this time. And we pray that you would bring us back together at your appointed time, not any, any time before or any time after, uh, not to look at what everybody else is doing. And some may already be going back and they have um, adequate cleaning and preparations. But, dear Lord, we just want to be right in the center of your will. And we pray that you would lead us and guide us. We ask these things in the most beautiful, precious, and holy name that we know, that of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.